So of course, before we do sports movies, we gotta do baseball. I mean, first off, it's my favorite sport. It's also God's favorite sport, you know, in the big inning. But then, only if we could have baseball and horror. Slasher even. Hey, what if we could have baseball horror and Jaws his own, Chief Brody himself, Roy Scheider, in the lead. In fact, if we're gonna go with Jaws, let's bring up the fact that his girlfriend in the film was technically playing his daughter-in-law in Jaws the Revenge. So let's head out to Texas, even though the um, poster is uh, the old Tiger Stadium, it's actually at the Astrodome, the old Astrodome. We'll go down Exploitation Alley with a little night game. What happens if I crowd the plate? Do you really think the worst controversy to happen to the Houston Astros was them cheating to the World Series in 2017 and 2019? What about the time that Chief Brody himself, Roy Scheider, was brought on down there to hunt a slashing serial killer with a bone to pick with said baseball team in 1989's Night Game. Baseball noises fill the air as we open up on the old Astrodome, the legendary original dome baseball fields. This is years before the Astros learned to use trash cans to win American League pennants. They were still in the National League at this point. Now they're playing the San Francisco Giants, which is interesting because screenwriter Spencer Eastman, who only had a few credits to his name, and this would actually be his last, uh, he passed before the film was even released, but he wrote it as a San Francisco set film with the Giants being the team. It was director Houston native Peter Masterson, probably known best for writing the best little whorehouse in, you guessed it, Texas, and he decided to move it to Houston and thus the Astros. He had just done Full Moon and Blue Water in Texas with The Hack Man, and his directorial debut had come just a few years before that, uh, Trip to Bountiful, which won Geraldine Page, the Best Actress Oscar, we will not be covering Trip to Bountiful on Hawkschlock. So anyhow, the Giants get their trivia-worthy cameo as we open up on the Astros, beating them, and cue the super sexy jazzy music score from Pino DiNaggio, probably best known for his work with Brian De Palma, but here we're in that Lethal Weapon era where everything has that sexy sax. Now, if you really want sexy sax, you might want to check out Fulci's The Devil's Honey. That film proves more than anything else, always practice safe sax. Send me your fetish psychiatric bills after seeing it. And then we're getting all sorts of landscape porn of the city of Houston, leading us to Chief Brody himself getting down to the sexy sax score. Say that five times fast. With his girlfriend, Karen Young, looking like 80s Walmart brand Anne Hesh here. Now, Karen Young had just played what technically was Roy Scheider's daughter-in-law in Jaws the Revenge had his character lived to, to be in that film. So, you know, age is just a number, right? And by number I mean two, the number of breasts Karen Young quickly shows in this scene to make you forget the age gap between the two. And we got another blonde on the beach, and this short-skirted dame is all a part of the night game, hence the title. An unseen assailant is slowly stalking her. His car is going about four miles per hour. He's about as obvious as an M. Night Shyamalan twist here. And she seems to recognize him when she does notice him, and we get just a few bits of actual gore here. You can cut the suspense with a slash to the throat. Then it's morning by the bay, and Chief Brody's awakened by the news of the murder. No, he doesn't think it's a shark this time. But we got the principal from the Breakfast Club, yes, Dwayne from Die Hard, professional jerkwad Paul Gleason. He's here playing basically the same character. He's just armed with a uh, terrible cowboy hat, some Texas lingo, and a wide array of song lyrics. Brody's here with his cool shades, and you just know he's a rugged cop by his attitude and his swagger. Now, Dwayne from Die Hard hates Chief Brody, but instead of getting into a fight, he's gonna go, and I quote, get a cup of hot mud. Meanwhile, Brody finds a handwritten note in the murder victim's panties. It says, best of luck. Now, I've done that same handwritten note in several of my boxer briefs, but it's never worked out for me. But Chief Brody then goes off and breaks into the deceased woman's room because in 1989, there was no Twitter to call him out for abuse of police powers. And who's gonna defund Chief Brody anyways, okay? Maybe the mayor. But it turns out that she's a hooker and he finds the secret diary of Laura Palmer there. Gee, I wonder if that'll come into play 
Police Procedural Screenwriting 101. We get more location porn. They're not going to leave an inch of Houston unfilmed. Our director and DP seem really pleased that they're filming on location, and the general aesthetic is basically HBO TV movie from the 80s and 90s. But who cares about that technical crap? It's time for a family slideshow. And by that I mean Brody and the uh, cops are going to go through the crime scene pictures, because this wasn't the first one. Our unseen villain leaves notes of little luck here and there at every murder. And Brody, who's spent a lot of time with a fishing captain named Quint, he's got the idea that maybe it's a fisherman's hook that has been used in all the murders. All in all, it's a really lax, casual investigation, including a second slideshow presentation for some reason, featuring more clicks than a clickbait article. Brody is just as interested in finding the killer as he is getting his ex-girlfriend slash future mother-in-law a new TV, state-of-the-art 19-inch TV, with most of the channels, 45 comes in a little fuzzy. And yes, you heard me right, not only is he dating the daughter, which is also his daughter-in-law from Jaws Revenge, but there's a whole bizarre thing beyond that. He was dating the mom at some point in their teenage high school days. He's kind of flirting with both. You can cut the sexual tension with a softcore porn plot from Cinemax in the early 90s. Seriously though, there's just as many scenes of Chief Brody arguing with his ex-girlfriend, future mother-in-law, over how much to spend on the wedding as there is of him doing any police investigation. We also get some subplots involving Chief Brody's dad having some kind of ties to organized crime. And of course there's controversy concerning Brody's relationship with several of these unsavory characters from his dad's past. And well, he had a baseball career, a failed baseball career at some point in his younger days. It's like somebody read Peter Benchley's Jaws and was like, you know what Spielberg got wrong? He cut out all those soap opera details like Chief Brody oogling the young girls in their bikinis and his wife having an affair with Matt Hooper. Let's go with that. And no shark, too. Don't expect any of these subplots to be properly explored, not that you cared. Anyhow, we also got the uh, the coach of the Hawks from The Mighty Ducks, the late Lane Smith. He's here, he's playing a politician with power. He can flex it in both good and bad ways. He wants to take over Chief Brody's investigation, but, but then he backs off a little bit, just like when Charlie Triple Deeked him. In this case, the Triple Deek is Chief Brody finds out that his top dog, Dwayne from Die Hard, has a thing for hookers, including the one murdered at the start of the flick. Even pre-Twitter, cops and hookers just don't mix. That brings me to another supporting character in this film of, of sorts, casual misogyny. Uh, Chief Brody's superior lets his secretary know that she's actually capable of bringing his water and aspirin at the same time because apparently she doesn't realize that, being a silly woman and all. Meanwhile, Brody interviews Walmart brand Lucia Fulci at a bar. He's sitting down writing his investigation notes on a cocktail napkin like he's the Don Draper of the Houston Police Department, which is, to be fair, more admirable than the way the Astros won the World Series in 2017. Anyhow, you know, slasher flicks, they're not known for having smart victims, but even with that low IQ standard, the victims here are just... well, they're just stupid. One blonde realizes she's being stalked, so she goes off a road and into a construction site in the middle of the night. She goes full Daniel Stern, she steps on a big nail, she's making all sorts of noise before a killer points really meanly with a hook. And now she's dead as that door now, to quote Charlie Dickens. And here's another thing, did you ever wonder what the Hall of Mirrors scene in John Wick 2 would look like had it been directed by Ronnie Howard? Well, look no further than the Hall of Mirrors sequences here as a girl goes in with her friend, I mean, it's a decent sequence, and that's exactly it. It's just average and full of untapped potential, just like the untapped potential OP provides in film after film. It really could have been the flick's highlight, uh, but it does get bonus points as the blonde victim in the Hall of Mirrors is played by Renee O'Connor. Yes, Xena Warrior Princess's sidekick, Gabrielle. Anyhow, you know what's coming down. It's gonna be Scheider getting too busy with the investigation, I mean, for once. And his Anne Hesch doppelganging gal pal is gonna be left, in this case at the movies. Late at night, she's picked up by a guy she knows. You know, to be fair, she should occasionally hang out with a guy that's within 20 years of her age range, but they head off to the club. Which brings me to the most unsurprising reveal we have here. So baseball is running throughout this whole thing on the radio, on the TV. Scheider finally figures out that the guy who keeps killing people is doing it after a certain pitcher for the Astros wins. So Scheider goes off to the Astrodome to do a little digging. Now the production required, of course, some actual game footage at the Astrodome. And uh, the script actually called for home run. And they didn't want to use what would have then just have been, you know, standard definition video, stock footage kind of thing. So they filmed some stuff and happened to be Glenn Davis hit one out and thus he gets his place in the film. It was one of 34 home runs he hit that year, which in the late 80s 
was a pretty good number during that uh, era that was just about to be taken over by the steroid-fueled Bash Brothers. But now most of the footage at the Astrodome was from a fake game with amateur squads, but the little bit of actual footage with little, you know, bits of real players, real crowd shots, that kind of thing, it really does add to the flick. It was only the fourth production to have anything filmed at the Astrodome. But anyhow, Scheider's at the Astrodome, he's there to do some digging, and suddenly Chief Brody's all, I know what the Astros did last summer, and no, I'm not talking about using trash can cheating signals to beat the Yankees and get in the World Series. He realizes all these killings keep happening after a certain pitcher wins games. A certain pitcher who was added to the roster, and another guy was cut. A guy who has since had an accident and now has a hook for a hand. Let's just guess that Einstein is not moonlighting as a detective for the Houston Police Department here. So anyhow, the cops are going to the killer's house. They find out he's made a newspaper shrine to the pitcher who's taken his job. Chief Brody, meanwhile, is off hunting him down. And we finally get a look at our villain, let's just say, if an innocent bystander doesn't stare at his hook, they're gonna stare at his face. It's like a bad cosplay of the Ripper from Last Action Hero. 80s Anne Hesh, Karen Young herself. Remember what I said about the IQ regarding victims here? Well, she's about to prove her point once again. There's a bad guy out there. She knows this guy's creepy. He's falling around. So, she leaves the club. Well lit, well attended. Who needs to be around people when a serial killer is chasing you down and creeping you out? And it all leads to our big showdown in the walkways overlooking the water. Chief Brody, he shows up, he tries to talk down our Slasher, even tries to butt him up with uh, talk of his mediocre stats and declining fastball. Oh, but Slasher isn't hooked by this, so he tosses Chief Brody through a plate glass window. Oh, but the Chief has killed two sharks without a fish hook, and now he's up and he plugs a few rounds into the Slasher, who falls a few stories down into the water as a chaser. Cue the wedding between Brody and his ex-girlfriend's daughter. And they head off to the ballpark because what girl doesn't want to spend her wedding night at a baseball game watching others score? All right, it's Schlosker time. We got best use of aged sunburnt leather for Chief Brody's face. Chief Brody also wins the golden cradle for robbing one after porking the mom. Weird even by blank check standards. The serial killings themselves get best integrity involving the Houston Astros winning any games. Best way to hook an audience. Best way for a creepy guy to get to nail the lady he fancies. Best worst supporting cowboy cop for Dwayne from Die Hard. Best long-standing continuity to keep Chief Brody near water. Be prepping that Sequest DSV captain's chair. On my Winona writer scale of schlock cinema, I give this three Winonas. It is a bit strange. I mean, it's central to baseball, but not really a baseball film. Yes, it's part slasher, but not really a whole lot of gore and only a little bit of nudity. It's part police procedural, but Nothing really that hard to figure out. I think the hot goth chick from NCIS could have solved this in half an episode. So with that, it comes... Highly recommended. Hawk shock!